Hi, and this is another Red Lion short, and we are speaking again to Michael Roberts, economist. And I'm going to start with the banking sector. And I'm just going to say to you, you know, crisis, what crisis? Is there a crisis or isn't there a crisis? Well, there is a crisis because uh, we haven't had a situation for since the global financial crash of 2008, where a quite large American bank collapsed and had to be uh, bailed out, liquidated and sold off uh, by the authorities, uh, followed by another bank uh, also collapsing and a third bank being so short of funds that it had to be uh, funded by a, a batch of six very large banks. Uh, all of these, by the way, in uh, California. But we do we did appear to have um, a new crisis in the banking sector. How often are we going to have to talk about crises in the banking sector every eight to 10 years? And that's the situation we're in. This particular crisis at the moment, of course, hasn't developed into a global financial nightmare that we saw in 2008. But nevertheless, it's the, the tensions and the stresses inside uh, the American economy and the uh, American sections of the American banks are visible indeed. And also, uh, Jackie, this has had certain contagion effects. It's it spread to Europe. And we saw uh, a 167-year-old Swiss bank, Credit Suisse, go down and be taken over by its rival UBS uh, through a forced marriage by the Swiss monetary authorities. And other banks have been rumoured of having trouble too in Europe, like Deutsche Bank. So we do have a crisis. It's not over. It's not as big as the global financial crash, but it's certainly one that cannot be ignored. And when we discuss, we can discuss why this is the case. OK, and 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 as a, a just an ordinary person, how is this going to affect me at the moment? So I all, 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 always think that we're very often when we talk about economics, it's kind of a bit distant yeah. to how it's going to affect me and my household and my community. How's it going to affect me? Well. The reason for the crash explains why how it's going to affect you. The, the immediate reason for, for these uh, banking crashes is the big rise in interest rates we've seen across the major economies in the world, in the United States, in Europe. And of course, we know in the UK, we've seen very sharp rises in interest rates driven by the central banks who set the, as it were, the floor for interest rates, the cost of borrowing uh, when you go. So when people go to borrow from the bank to buy a big ticket item like a maybe a car or some other item that costs more than they can afford on their weekly or monthly salary, uh, or companies, particularly small ones who need funds to uh, keep going and to invest, uh, the cost of borrowing to do that, to get credit, is been rising quite significantly as the central banks have been hiking rates. And that means that affects you and me. You, we can see that already in the ability, if you have to get a mortgage, uh, that the uh, mortgage rates have gone up. If you're renting a property, you're finding rents are going up because the landlords are pushing up rents because quite often they're buy-to-let landlords who are borrowing money to buy these properties and then renting them out at a profit. So everywhere it's having an effect upon the cost of living, particularly in areas like the, the big items where you have to borrow funds. And it also means that a lot of funds that would normally be available to help the economy grow by investment and cheap funding has disappeared. We've had 10 years of really cheap uh, uh, borrowing, which has led to a big stock market and bond market boom. Our financial assets have boomed, uh, uh, but it also has, has helped to some extent to maintain some level of growth. But now that's being squeezed. And that's why the squeeze has led in some cases to the weakest and the most uh, specialized. Uh, banks in niche corners that have fallen uh, to the ground. And they've fallen because the interest rates have gone up and the, the bonds and assets that they bought are worth less as a result. But I, I can explain that to the viewer if they want. But basically, they're, they're, the assets that they've been purchasing have fallen because interest rates have gone up. And suddenly their depositors, the people who have been giving them money in their banks, which in this case were mainly uh, tech startups and rich individuals in California, have found 
in, they're, they're not making so much money because interest rates have risen. So they've been taking out more of their cash rather than leaving it in the bank. And suddenly this bank found that it was so much money was leaving it that it couldn't actually fund it. It was a classic what they call a bank run where depositors suddenly panicked and took all their money out of the bank and the bank couldn't cover those deposits and uh, collapsed and had to be bailed out or supported by funds by the uh, the government and monetary authorities. OK, so now I'm confused. I'm going to show you my confusion. Yeah, because. I'm confused about the relationship between interest rates and inflation. Mm. I've been hearing, I think from the Bank of England and from other sort of people, that the problem with inflation, and I really don't understand it, is that we have too many people in the population not working. <laughs> it hasn't got to do with interest rates. And to me, that just basically doesn't make any sense. And it strikes me as just being another way where, if you like, people are pointing at workers and saying, well, actually, you need to get off your butts and do more work. And that's what will bring the cost of living down. And somehow the interest rates does, doesn't have anything to do with it. Can you explain this? Well, I think you're right. Uh, I'll tell you, loads of economists are puzzled by the comments of Governor Bailey. Uh, suggesting that uh, the rock cause of inflation, or at least one of the main causes of inflation, is that there's a, a shortage of labour caused by people retiring and not going back to work after COVID. Uh, well, well, this is a big shocker. I, I, I try to understand it. I think, I tell you viewers, I think what he's trying to say is this, that because a lot of people didn't go back to work after COVID because they were maintained illness or because they decided to retire early and there was no point in continuing, or because they don't want to work in low paid jobs and looking for better jobs. All those reasons have led to a, a, a significant shortage, of particularly of skilled labour, uh, not only in the UK, but in the US and Europe as well. And Bailey is claiming because it's a shortage of labour, that means that workers are bargaining up their wages too much and driving up uh, prices. This is nonsense, of course, because prices were rising well before wages rose. Exactly. And the reason prices were rising was nothing to do with the shortage of labour in the, and the labour market. It was to do to the dramatic increase in energy and food prices uh, during the uh, supply blockages and closure down after po COVID and during the following year. And we've seen huge multinational energy and food companies hiking up their prices to record levels in order to get huge, huge profits, $200 billion from the five multinationals have made in profits in the last year in the oil sector. That's where the inflation has been driven by. Workers are trying to catch up with that. We just had the UK figures for inflation, which went up, not down, 10.4% uh, year on year. And um, no, no worker who's been on strike, or even if they haven't been on strike, has been able to get that sort of uh, wage increase to compensate for a 10% increase in one year. Over the two years since the end of COVID, 15 to 20 percent increases in prices. Just go in the shops and anything you want to buy. That's the difference, particularly in food. So it's absolutely nothing to do with the shortage of labour. This is a nonsense. But the central banks want to claim that the problem with inflation is a wage price spiral, that workers are going to drive up prices by asking for more, more money and because they've got more bargaining power. You turn that round the other way, Jackie, what they really want you to do is to lose your bargaining power. They want you to not have any power to, to, to improve your workers, your conditions and wages and to get keep unemployment up so that you don't have that bargaining power uh, and, uh, and look for more labour that way at a cheap rate, which is what they used to have before. That's what they're looking at. Interest rates have no effect on inflation at the moment. Even mainstream economists recognise that the hiking of interest rates by central banks is having no effect on inflation. What's bringing inflation down, and it's fallen a little bit over the last three or four months, is because food and oil prices have started to come down a bit. That's, I mean, they're still 15 to 20 percent higher than they were, but they're starting to slow in their inflationary rate. So that's bringing inflation down. Nothing to do with the central banks hiking interest rates, presumably to stop us uh, spending uh having a bargaining power so bailey says or uh where there's too much money being spent by us workers and we need to stop you spending this is a ludicrous argument but that's what the central banks fall back on because what they want to do is blame it on working people the crisis and not on the failure of the system to provide decent uh supply 
and decent wages for people without inflation. Thank you. I mean, that makes me feel like I'm a more sane person now. <laughs> and it also reminds me about this kind of myth of the Bank of England being independent, so to speak, because, of course, they're part of, you know, an establishment that wants to remove as much bargaining power from the workers mm -hmm. as possible. Now, one of the things that has come up uh, as a question um, from some people I've been speaking to is this thing called, and I'm reading it now because I must get it right, the Central Bank Digital Currency. Yeah. Is it a thing? What is it? And <laughs> should we be, we be worried about it? It's it's a thing. Uh, what it is, is that, um, as you know, uh, already much of our operations in doing our ordinary transactions uh, are digital already. I mean, I don't know about you, but most a lot of people get their salary, salary or wage digitally. They don't get it in cash. They don't get it in check. They get it uh, to their bank account directly by transfer. We make all our payments by transfer. I know some of us might still go down to the bank and do it, but a lot of us sit on sit behind computers like this and press buttons and hope that it all goes through. So already much of the transactions that are taking place are, are digital. Uh, the idea of a digital currency is on a national level to say that, look, um, maybe we can organize the currency system better if the central bank introduces a currency where you can take an account out with the central bank and you can put your money there and they will pay you rather than going through the commercial banks. And this digital currency gives a certain power to the central bank uh, to control the money supply better than relying upon the commercial banks to do their job. Also, it gives the government a lot more power because everything is in control but digitally. Nothing, there's no cash. Uh, then you can't put your money under the mattress because you don't want the banks to get hold of it because, in fact, there are, everything is digitalized. And in this way, it apparently is going to be more efficient. Costs will be reduced because transactions are done digitally. On the other hand, there are certain dangers in that central banks, so-called independent central banks, uh, will be in control of the whole process of money transactions. Uh, I'll just add on that independence business. Yes, central banks are independent. They're independent of us. They're independent of, the, of democratic control through parliament and government, but they're not independent of uh, big business and the financial system. That's what they're there for. They're not there really to provide um, support for us as a public service. They're there to ensure that uh, city, the city of London and other financial sectors don't have too much inflation and they're and their bonds and their financial assets are safe uh, and that they can be moved around cheaply. That's what they're there for. Nothing to do with helping us. I suspected as much. I'm just wondering if some creative, I don't know, computer nerd might come up with a digital mattress that we can, <laughs> we can put our digital money uh, under. But just to end, what would you say is the, the, the thing on the economic horizon that we should be looking out for? What, what, what would be the thing that you would alert our viewers to that's going to perhaps be coming down soon? Yeah, well, I think actually what the banking crisis that we've seen in America and Europe has demonstrated is there's now a serious division between the efforts of the central banks to control inflation completely uselessly by raising interest rates and the danger of a financial collapse because of the rising interest rates is putting stresses on the banking system and other sectors of the economy. So there's a, a battle now between should the central banks go on raising interest rates to, to control inflation or basically drive down our uh, ability to defend ourselves and our living conditions, or uh, at the expense possibly of having a financial crash, or should they stop raising interest rates to, so that the banking system doesn't get into trouble, but then find that they can't control inflation anymore or they become totally useless? And this is a problem for the central banks. What does it mean for working people? Well, if interest rates keep on going up, which they have been, and uh, central banks are talking about doing this for another year, at least six months, and keeping them very high, then it's going to squeeze the economy, the real economy where people are working to produce things that matter, uh, are to death. We're going to enter a slump. Uh, where profits, are, which have been dramatically increased in the last couple of years for most com for the big companies, not the small ones, are now starting to go down even for the big companies. And at the same time, interest is going up. So there's, this, as it were, two 
two angles, one from the bottom and one from the top, squeezing the ability of companies to grow. We're going to see over the next year, unless the policies change, uh, perhaps probably more banking collapses, but also starting to see companies closing down or laying off labor. And we're moving towards a more traditional sort of slump that we haven't had only three years ago. We had one, 2020, the pandemic slump. And then we had one, of course, in the Great Recession of 2008-9. It seems that if we continue with the policies now, that's what we have to look for. Will, it, will interest rates keep on going up, squeezing us to death and to squeezing uh, the companies to death? Or will they stop that because they fear a, a financial instability and collapse? The central bank governors don't know. They don't know which way to go at the moment. They're in a dilemma. But they, did, at the moment, are deciding the issue for us. That's great. Thanks very much. And um, uh, I'm sure we'll be speaking again sometime yeah. soon to see how the economy is going. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jackie.